the fact that this this number is independent of units it makes it a, it makes it a very fundamental number in science and one in, in which as well that if you decide to want to get in touch with some aliens on, on some distant planet uh, going around uh, orbiting around a star perhaps a bit like our, our own sun it would be one of the numbers you would signal to these aliens if you if to indicate that we have uh, a scientific and technologically capable civilization on this planet what is astounding is that the most complex of of the constants or at least the the hardest to even measure is known as the fine structure constant or alpha now without question it, it, it it's it's a mystery 137 refers to the um, the electrons it's the odds of an electron absorbing a single photon and in simple Kabbalah language to, to turning it to the, the spiritual meaning of that it's about vessel and light or the physical body of man and his ability to ignite the light from his soul that's how it's seen in a in its spiritual sense so, one more quote, physicists love this number, not just because it is dimensionless, but also because this is a combination of three fundamental constants of nature. Why do these constants come together to make the particular number 1 over 137 and not some other number? <laughs> Dunno, afraid. And so... Feynman, for example, in, in his classical those three classic textbooks he wrote for, 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 for the undergraduate courses at, uh, at Caltech. Um, I can't quote from him directly, but he felt that this was a number, you know, that, was, that all physicists were very, very deeply attached to, and almost has a magic to it, because you, there's no theory that explains why it has the value it has. I mean, this is the, the mystery of it, it's just this value. But you can be sure that if the value were a little bit different from the value it actually has, we wouldn't be around here talking about it now. Yeah, it's the crux of it. If it were the tiniest, tiniest bit off from this, we wouldn't exist. I can quote him directly, actually. <laughs> there is a most profound and beautiful question associated with the observed coupling constant E, the amplitude for a real electron to emit or absorb a real photon. This is, this is Feynman speaking. It has been a mystery ever since it was discovered more than 50 years ago, and all good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. <laughs> Feynman had a quite a good sense of humor. Immediately, you would like to know where this number for a coupling comes from. Is it related to pi, or perhaps to the base of natural logarithms? Nobody knows. It's one of the great damn mysteries of physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say... The hand of God wrote that number, and we don't know how he put it. But now going back to the pyramid, you saw how I took just basically the basic proportions, not cherry-picking at all, just, oh, you know, the base is 440, the height is 280 cubits, and everything else follows from that given. I mean, everything else is literally inherent in those two basic numbers. And so I wondered is the fine structure constant in the pyramid as well as those other constants that I've seen on the cover of the sonnets. And it turns out to be this simple height and diagonal divided by the side slope and twice the base gives you the fine structure constant to 99.9998 percent accuracy. What? <laughs> yeah, what? How can that be? What about the reduced Planck constant? That's this, which he mentioned, h-bar. Again, just that simple, okay, a side slope and a height and a diagonal divided by two corner slopes and a side slope. It's called the reduced Planck constant. It's the 99.9995 percent accurate. These are the most accurate of all the constants. <laughs> Pi is close, phi is close, e is close, e minus one is close. All of them are. The, the, and I, I, I go looking for this and I go, 
oh my goodness, the most complex of all, the most fundamental of all, the ones that are telling us the utter simplest basic truth of what are the chances that physical reality, the electron, could turn into spiritual reality, light. Let there be light. It's these mysterious numbers that together create 137, or it's inverse. And, and, and it's accurate to basically round it to five decimal places. 99.99995. And here's Shakespeare and D through Shakespeare on the mathematical side telling us about that. And the two of them together are what give us this beautiful equation that that professor just showed us. I'm now going to take it to another level. I was blessed to be in the Great Pyramid on my second trip there. We uh, did the usual bakshish, which means a, a bribe. <laughs> you, you, uh, you give... Uh, enough money to a guard and they'll let you in privately and I was there one morning before all the tourists would get there very very early and had it to myself for an hour uh, so I was meditating sitting there and I was thinking you know it's very interesting I know that this structure uh, the height and the width and the length of it is is what gives us golden ratio and gives us a three four five triangle diagonally across you don't see it on a wall or a floor but it's a diagonal three four five kind of hidden very cleverly and that by doing that you end up seeing that it's actually giving you golden ratio as well and those are sort of basics and you'd think well they, all right any great you know if they knew something about mathematics and geometry they would know that it doesn't explain how it was built but it's still the math uh, my dear friend Nala Berkey in Australia, Australia has uh, done wonderful graphics occasionally for me, and this is his. These are his graphics, um, where he shows what I had intuited. I'm sitting there, I'm meditating, and all of a sudden, I got this realization that that the sarcophagus is the only other thing that's sitting there. You're looking at a sarcophagus in this perfect, otherwise perfect shape, that is geometrically perfect to give you golden ratio and the other things that I've mentioned. But what's the sarcophagus doing there? We know it's not the burial chamber for a pharaoh. All right? You can only slide it into that room on its side because its height is greater, slightly greater than its, uh, than its width. And as I was sitting there meditating, I just had the intuition, oh, I think it's to do with that. If you turn it on its side, you can measure how many there would be, how many would fit into the height of the king's chamber and how, how many would fit into the width. And I, a quick sort of back of the mind calculation, I thought, I bet it, I think it's six by five. Anyway, I, that started me off. And once I left, I went home and did the math on it and found it was absolutely accurate. Here's a visual representation of that. So there's the sarcophagus sitting there alone, and if you turn it on its side and you think, all right, because if you did it vertically, it wouldn't work. When you turn it on its side, precisely six fit to the height, and precisely five fit to the width. Well, that's a very interesting combination, five and six, hermetic numbers that are really important. And then you calculate the length of it, and you say, well, how many, well, why did they choose that particular length? I wondered how many would fit in, and it's not an exact number, at least not a, a perfect number of lengths of sarcophagi, because there's the one, and it turns out that if you put them all in together, you end up with 137.5 of them, and now 137.5 is another way of expressing golden ratio, because for those of you who know that the golden ratio is a length compared to another length, right? If you divide angles according to golden ratio, you get 137.5 degrees, and, and its balance is the, on the other side of that. So it's telling you that again. But I thought, well, that's weird. That's redundant. They've already told us the golden ratio. Then I realized, oh, the sarcophagus is almost 
exactly, precisely. Half of it is air and half of it is stone. Its volume inside is precisely the volume of the stone that it is made of in the outside of it. And then surrounding that is then just air of the king's chamber. So if you literally calculate the amount of nothingness in the king's chamber, including the half of a sarcophagus that's inside the sarcophagus itself, then what number do you end up with? You end up with 137 nothingnesses and just a half of a sarcophagus of somethingnesses. So they very cleverly and very poetically have summed up that whole mystery of what the fine structure is about. It's about turning solid electron mass into poof, going back to spirit, going back to invisibility, to nothingness. It's 137 to 1, the sarcophagus to the king's chamber. Now that is a paradigm-shifting thought because they could have chosen any width and height. They didn't have to make it be precisely 6 by 5. All right, that gives you then 30 of them blocked up against a wall. And they could have chosen any length. All right, that's negotiable, but they chose just the length that, that would then give you 137.5 of them would fill the king's chamber perfectly, and 137 of them would be nothingness. It's, uh, it's astounding. It would be telling you, we know all this. We know this stuff. We're way ahead of you guys. Catch up.